You know, when you walked in, you were handed, I, I call this a message map. And make sure you take this out because there's going to be an area, some blanks that you, that you fill in as you take this journey along with us. Lisa, it is such a privilege, isn't it, for both of us to be here, to be back home. It is. It's, it's especially um, sentimental, I guess you could say, for Ed and I to be here because when we were first married, Ed was on staff here at Second Baptist for, for eight years. Yeah. Our oldest daughter, Lee Beth, was born in Houston, and she was dedicated right on this stage. So Second Baptist is a part of our lives. It's a part of our heritage. It, it's a church that has been home to us uh, for so long, but also has deposited into us so that 32 years ago, when we went to Dallas-Fort Worth to start Fellowship Church, um, we were equipped in ways that we're so grateful for. And it's especially wonderful for us and sentimental as well to have Fellowship Church joining us for this day as we share a very uh, important story, a very um, difficult story, if you will, but our church home in Dallas is connected with our church home in Houston. So we're excited to be here. Yes, we are. You know, everyone, and this is not a profound statement at all, but everyone processes pain. I remember I had heart surgery a couple of years ago. I had a mitral valve prolapse. In fact, I went to Houston. I went right here to get the surgery. And after the surgery, they had this chart in the room, and it, and it says, like, your level of pain, 1 to 10. Have you ever seen that? You know, the, the smiley face, like zero pain, the frown, and then the ah like that? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Pain is pain. I know a lot of us are emerging from a lot of the parties and things we went to over the holidays, and you're in a conversation, and, and you're talking about A, B, and C. You're talking about sports. You're talking about the weather. You're talking about maybe your business, and all of a sudden, just try this. Bring up the subject of pain. Just say, I'm going to pivot now in the conversation. Let's talk about pain. All of a sudden, you'll see people shifting nervously, looking down. Uh, excuse me, I, I've got to go, and I'll get something to eat or drink, and, and you'll find yourself alone because we don't really dig talking about pain. And yet, pain is the great equalizer of humanity. If you're speaking with someone in a conversation or if you're sitting in a room like this, you are surrounded by people who have either been through pain of some sort, they are going through it right now, or they are emerging from it. So pain is universal. It connects us all. And even though maybe at a party we don't want to bring pain up because of how it might affect the mood, but I can tell you this, pain is a connector. And as Ed and I have learned to share our story, we have seen many others who say, wow, I'm not alone in my pain. There are other people who are processing pain and walking along the path of pain. And most people are just two or three questions away from revealing their pain to you. And we're not here at all to say our pain is here and your pain is there. We're not here to compare pain. But I've got to say, and you know this, the pain question is the biggest beef against Christianity. It's called a theodicy. In other words, and we've all thought this, how could a good God allow suffering in the world? How could God allow what's going on in the Middle East? How could God allow this recent school shooting? How could God allow a loved one to get a bad report from the doctor? And in our case, how could God allow our daughter to tragically and suddenly pass away? I've asked those questions, and so have you. And we're gonna find out today that pain is ubiquitous, pain has a purpose, and pain has a platform. We don't know all of the answers. And that's tough for me because I'm a, I'm a why guy, you know? And, and, and when Lebeth passed away, honey, 
Those, those questions, the why questions, echoed in our minds and, and, and they were front and center in our conversations. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, Lee Beth, as I said, is our oldest and she was raised here for the first three years of her life right here at Second Baptist. She was a, a thriving young woman, very much that firstborn personality, the achiever, uh, the overachiever, if you will. She was very strong and, and all through high school, she was such a rule keeper. Like she would rat people out so quickly. It was like, oh, yeah. no mom, you don't want me hanging around with that. And so um, she grew into this beautiful young woman, graduated from college, and began to work at Fellowship Church. And she was one of our thriving staff members. Yeah, she had the unique ability, I should say abilities. She had creativity and leadership, and, and she could run in both lanes, which is a rarity. Most of the time, you'll, you'll, you'll work with someone who's innovative, and they're kind of in that space, and hey, you stay over there, and the leaders are kind of over there. Lee Beth had that connection, which, which was highly unusual. And she uh, was a part of our Fellowship Church staff. In fact, today, in her absence, there is like a vacuum of where no she served and how she contributed. And all of the staff at Fellowship would say the very same thing. But when she was in her mid to, uh, late 20s, she went through a series of failed relationships. And she struggled with anxiety, which is a common uh, connector, if you will, for those who possibly um, struggle with addiction. And she was dealing with anxiety, some depression, and she began to self-medicate with alcohol, specifically binge drinking. She went through a series of issues with that, and, and eventually we uh, had her put in a rehab, which she was willing to go. She came out of that doing well, very, very supportive of the AA program, Ed and I became uh, very familiar yes. with it, read through the books, and were supporting her. But she lived on her own, and it was during COVID, and a lot of the groups were not meeting in person, and she relapsed. And to this day, it's just something that's very messy, especially for a family who is in ministry. I mean, addiction is messy overall. But here Ed and I were pastors and leaders, and we've been pure and faithful to the Lord, and so you know, we're asking, why? How is it that this is happening to us, to our family? Lee Beth has three siblings. EJ is our son. Uh, and then we have twin daughters, Laurie and Landra, who are the babies of the family. And none of them wanted to see their sister suffer like she was suffering. And it was just a, a, a time in our lives where literally the geological plates shifted when she passed away. And I'd be lying to you to say that we're the same today as we were three years ago. We will never be the same. Of course, we still laugh and, and we, we, we still follow God's amazing plan and agenda for our lives, but we're always gonna have a wound that's, that's fresh to the touch. And who knows what pain that you're processing. It could be an addiction, it could be anxiety, it could be depression. It could be maybe the loss of a loved one recently. It could be someone who betrayed you in the business world or, or someone who, who walked out on you. Pain is there. Now, this is not a doggy downer message. I don't want you to leave here and go, oh, wow, woe is me. I'm a lowly worm. No, no, no. This is an encouraging message because Lisa and I want to tell you that there are parallel tracks when it comes to pain. One track is the track of pain. It's the track of doubt. It's the track of questions. It's the track of regret. What I shoulda, coulda, you know? The other track though, and this other track dominates the one I just mentioned. The other track is the track of joy, compassion, peace, and purpose like, like I can't even articulate. Because how many, how many fathers do we have here? If you're a father, lift your hand. If you're a father, okay. You know, when I was a young dad and four kids, and I still can't believe we have four kids, but we do. And now we have six We're way grandkids. too young for that. Yeah, we're only 38, both I of know. us. So. 
And our last name is Young, so we will be forever young. And then I just want to stop. Yeah. I know it's a little weird yeah. because you have two Ed and Lisa Youngs in the midst of, <laughs> of Second Baptist. For those of you who don't know, yes, Fellowship she's Church. Lisa Young, number one. I'm the, I, I was yeah, the, first. She's the first. I was the first. So anyway, but for those at Fellowship Church, when Ed's mom passed yeah. away several years later, Ed's yeah. father took a new bride, and her name is Lisa. So there are two Ed and Lisa it's Youngs. It's a little confusing. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Changing the subject, but still kind of staying, staying on point. You know, as a father, sometimes, dads, we have these nightmarish thoughts. What would happen if something happened to my family? What would happen if tragedy struck with my son or daughters? I remember thinking that and going, man, if something happened like that, I would lose it. I, I mean, I don't know if I could go on. I, I, I used to think, would I, would I turn my back on the faith? And those are questions, real questions, that, that we turn over and over on the rotisserie grills of our minds, fathers do. Yet, Lisa, as we've talked about and shared about and as we write about, when this happened, I cannot tell you, I cannot describe to you the peace and the supernatural presence of God. Not that I still don't have moments of anger, not that we still don't jump into the pool of regret and would have, could have, should have. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the joy track overtakes the other. So we want to talk about the path right now, Lisa, that we're all on. Because God says he has a path, a purpose for all of our lives. And, and we've given you this message map to talk about this path. You could call it God's path for you in 2024. You can call it, as, as we do, a path through pain, because pain is something that, that we all experience. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear. We're not going to emerge from, from this planet unscathed, are we? We will suffer. We will go through difficult times because we live in a broken place. We live in a fallen world. And God's love and grace and, and free will, because we have of a free will, God rolled the dice when he did that because due to that issue, there's the option of choosing something else or someone else or another way other than God's way, and that, in a nutshell, that's not all of the answers, is why we have this thing called pain and suffering. And the scripture tells us it rains on the just and the unjust. But, but, but how many times have you heard this? God is good all of the time. All of the time, God is good. Well, that sounds really sexy, doesn't it? It's true. It doesn't mean, that saying does not mean God is good when things are good. God is good when things are good, and God is good when things are bad. So we have this amazing purpose, this amazing path for our life, and we have lifted out of the pages of Scripture the perennial path verse, where I should say verses, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You'll see it at the bottom of your outline. Now, if any of you are school teachers like I go. am, I taught first grade across the way at Second Baptist School many, many years ago. And you don't usually go from bottom to top. But this path that we're going to share with you today goes from the bottom to the top. So the teachers in the room, we just have to get over ourselves for a little bit. Yeah. So we're going to ask four critical questions, four quick questions. And I want you to think about your life right now. And you could even do a pain audit to think about the pain you've processed in the past. So just think about the next steps you'll take. As we're walking down this amazing path, we've got to ask ourselves four questions. And they're found in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Number one what? What? And that is dependency. What? The Bible says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The word trust means to lie helplessly before a victorious general. The word trust is faith. Because, I know this might shock you, there's no such thing as certainty in the Bible. <gasps> what? No. Doubt and faith run on parallel tracks. If there was certainty, there's no faith. The just shall live by 
faith. So what? I've got to depend on God. It's not like put your right foot in, take your right foot out, your right foot in, and shake it all about. It's just not that, because that's hokey pokey. It is the totality of who you are before God. And the Bible says, Lisa, one of our favorite scriptures is in Hebrews. Chapter 6, verse 19. And it says, we have an anchor for, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. And that is just a beautiful picture of Jesus he is the one that we trust. He is the one that secures us in any storm of life. Now, Ed and I are fishermen and women. How many fishermen do we have? Anybody? You know, fish? fishing is a biblical sport. Sometimes people make fun of me because I talk about fishing a lot. It's biblical. And I will Jesus tell you, said, followers fish. And I'm going to tell you that Ed lucked out when he was 50. Well, you were 14 years old, yes, and I, I was 15, and we met in Sunday school at church, and he realized that I enjoyed fishing. And he's like, okay, that's the girl I'm going to date. And so we have just loved that throughout our lives, and, and we fish. So we found that when you're in a boat, you're going to sometimes, uh, well, all the time, yeah. you need an anchor. Yeah, one time I made the stupid mistake of trying to make a homemade anchor when I was a kid. I took some, really I stole it. I stole some of my mom's clothesline and I got a Clorox bottle, filled it full of sand, tied the clothesline to the Clorox bottle, but, but, but here's where I messed up. I misjudged the length of the cord, so I rode out into this little lake, dropped the anchor overboard because I thought I could fish and everything would be cool, I could stay in one spot, but the anchor was about five feet off of the bottom. And I watched the sand dissipate, and I'm like, what? And I was blown all over the lake. I've got to ask you a question straight up. What or who is your anchor? If it's not Jesus Christ, you're anchoring with clotheslines and Clorox bottles. And so many of us go, okay, it's going to be finances, or it's going to be popularity, or it's gonna be power, or it's gonna be this or that. And yeah, it might hold for a little while, but you're gonna get blown all over the lake. Do you mind if I brag a little bit about fishing? Do you mind? I mean, I'm at home. You don't mind this, do you? This is kind of a humble brag. You don't mind, do you? Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I went on an expedition off of the Atlantic coast and some friends of mine and I caught a great white shark on a rod and reel that weighed 3,000 pounds. Here's, here's the picture. Took us two hours to reel in this Leviathan. And can I add, Ed, that he mentioned 3,000 pounds, conservatively 2,800 pounds, and there was a scientist on board the boat who verified, who verified the that. Because yes. otherwise, it could be just another fishing story. Yeah, you know preachers. You can't and trust fishermen. their numbers. And, and fishermen. fishermen. But I trust fishermen more than preachers. But anyway, <laughs> you might go, well, oh, man, how did you catch that? That's amazing. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? You know why we caught it? Because my friend... Captain Chip Michaelove, who is like the guy for great white sharks, has this little boat, nothing big. But he has a system of anchoring at the right place, the right tides, the right currents. That, friends, is why we caught the great white. Are you anchored? But Lisa, here's the thing about the inversion of Christianity. Our anchor doesn't go down, it goes up. Because the Bible says Jesus is our anchor and literally our anchor goes into the holy most place behind the curtain. So that is trust. That's trust that's firm and secure and even when those rogue winds blow, the anchor holds. That's right. This, that's what, that's, that's what. That's the what. The next is the why. The why. And it says, and lean not on your own understanding. That's the fluency of trusting in God. We will never understand what 
pain is inflicted upon us. We will never understand how we're going through it. In fact, the first thing that Ed and I did was go, well, why God? Yeah. Why, explain to me why this had to happen to us. Why is, is this pain so for, uh, first and foremost in our lives? I mean, again, we've lived this faithful life serving you. God, we don't deserve this. We don't understand this. Mm -hmm. And we can never rely on our own understanding. Ed mentioned just a moment ago, he said, you know, we don't have certainty, we have faith. But I'll tell you what we do have is we have a faithfulness in God, not just certainty, but the fact that he has stood the test of time in our lives. So I look back at my journals, I look back at, at different times of pain that Ed and I have gone through, and this is not the only pain that we've faced. We've faced many different levels of pain throughout yeah, we were our writing lives. Yeah, we were writing a book on marriage, and it just sounds important, but it's not. And our agent said that we had gone through seven out of the ten markers for divorce. Just pain. The things, the painful just the things pain that, that we had gone we through. have endured. And so I look back at the journals that I have done in my own quiet time with the Lord, and I've seen, yes, I have and serve a faithful God because I would write something down in a moment of pain and then I would see how he showed up and he was faithful. But I don't understand everything. And we have to understand that we don't understand. Yeah, Lisa, in our humanity, we think God owes us an explanation. Okay, I'm not gonna step out on faith. I'm not gonna do, God, what you want me to do because of this painful situation. If you would explain it to me, God, give me the 411. Okay, spill the tea, God, and when you give me all the answers, then, then, then I'll serve you. We don't have the bandwidth to even understand it. That's right. That's where trust comes in. And I'm not talking about being an intellectual idiot. I'm not talking about checking your brains at the door. We're talking about thinking also, we're talking about trusting and not leaning on our own understanding, which brings us to the third question, what, why, when, when? Well, the Bible says it, in all your ways, acknowledge him. That's the immediacy of it. Let's That's like right. right now. Right now. When I look back over this time three years ago, in fact, the anniversary of Lee Beth's passing will be January the 19th, this upcoming month, uh, in a few weeks. And... It's always a tough day, and when I look back on that, I think about that moment when we realized that our daughter had graduated from this life to heaven, that it was then that we needed the comfort and the compassion of our Lord and Savior. It was that moment, it was immediate that we mm -hmm. needed that intimacy with him to know that he was with us on this path. And then the other question, the fourth question is where and that's intimacy with God. You can fill that in. Where, that's intimacy with God. And he will make your path straight. So check out, our part is we trust, we don't lean on our own understanding. In all of our ways we acknowledge him. And how sweet is this deal? God says, I will make your path straight. In other words, the Holy Spirit of God is like will go before us with a machete, whoosh, whoosh, a weed eater, whoosh, to clear the path as we're walking in sync with the Savior. So those are four questions. And when we answer those four questions and live those out, we're gonna discover these powerful principles that I wanna talk about. The powerful path principles. We've talked about it already, Lisa, but God establishes a plan. He has established a plan. In fact, if you could write your plan out selfishly for your life and you were to compare that plan with God's plan, God's plan would blow it out of the water. Like I'm sure a lot of people just recently have done New Year's resolutions. Oh, yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Well, I'm not a New Year's resolution person because my New Year's resolution is the same every year. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. And that's the plan that God has for us. So whatever we write down, I mean, yes, it's great to have goals and things like that, but nothing we can plan for ourselves will ever come close to the plan that God has for us. And God's plan... Is, is, is simply glorious and gloriously simple. It's to know him, it's to walk with him, and to walk in community. The only thing Jesus ever built was the local church. 
He didn't build a parachurch organization. He didn't build a school, sorry, but no cigar, and I like cigars. He built the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And, and Lisa and I are products of the church. Forget that, that I'm a pastor's kid. Forget that Lisa is a pastor's wife. We're products of the church. In the moment I began to turn my back on the thing that Jesus built is the moment I'll get off the path and off the course and go off the ranch and miss the magic that he has. And that's why, it, again, I mentioned it was so sentimental for us to be connecting with Fellowship Church because during this time in our lives, that community, that fellowship and second and so many people around the world, they were like an army of prayer warriors. And many the, people here, Lisa, Oh yes, supported us, us and surrounded us and we could feel it. And it was literally as if God lift us, lifted us out of a pit and said, you are not alone. And that's the beauty of community. We get to come every week and even more during the week to be a part of a community that loves, supports, encourages, and equips us to walk this path with God. So God established it also too. God illuminated and illuminates our path. It's almost like the headlights on a car. I mean, they just give you enough asphalt, enough concrete to keep on going. You know what I'm saying to you? I remember when, when we were kids, Ben and I were probably, I don't know, eight and 10, dad had the brilliant idea of, of, of walking down through the woods. We lived in an area that was kind of outside of town. And he said, let's, let's, let's watch the sunset. Ed, make sure, uh, you, you got the flashlight? Yes, sir, dad, I got it. So we walked down and we're standing on the edge of this little lake, you know, we would call it a tank, Texans, you know. And the sun is setting, and we're looking around. And Dad goes, boys, have you ever seen a water moccasin swimming? No. There's one right there. Wow. Sure enough. And Ben goes, Dad, is that another one? <laughs> it sure is. I said, there's another one and another one, and another one, and they're around our feet. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was some sort of a mating call season or full moon, whatever. I don't, I don't know what was happening. We were surrounded at night with water moccasins. And I'll never forget what my father said. Ben, Ben, jump into my arms. Ed, I've got your hand. Get that flashlight. And I'm, you know, shining the flashlight we're going to get out of here. And, and, and so find the path through the woods. And I'm looking and I find the path through the woods and we begin to walk along that path. And then I'll never forget this. I saw our porch light on in the distance and we made it home. Do you find yourself surrounded by water moccasins? Do you find yourself freaked out in fear? I've got some good news for you. This is our light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and God's path will always take you home. Path, it's a purpose that always takes us to him. So if we understand that God has established it, if we understand honey, that God has illuminated it, then we can alter it. To take you back to that day in 2021 uh, that Lee Beth passed away on January the 19th, I was out of town visiting my mother. We were transi transitioning her to a memory care facility, so I'd flown to South Carolina to be with my sister to do that. And that Monday morning, I received a, a pocket call from Lee Beth and I tried to call her back and she didn't answer. And then a moment later, her, twin, uh, her sister Landra, one of the twins, called me and she said, Mom, I just got a pocket call from Lee Beth. And I tried to call her back and she's not answering. And I knew that that was not good. And so I called Ed 
and I said, honey, something's not right. He drove to her home. She lived alone. She had a beautiful home, and he found her just in disarray, passed out, and it's every parent's nightmare. And he cleaned her up, tried to sober her up, and took her to her therapist, met with her therapist, and they talked about a plan, and Lee Beth was kind of becoming more and more aware. And I even talked to her that afternoon with Ed. We FaceTimed because he took her back to our home so that she could be there with him. And I FaceTimed, I was trying to get a flight home, and, and I FaceTimed her, and we talked, and we said, honey, this is going to take your life. Do you want to live? She goes, Mom, Dad, I want to live, and I want to live for God. She loved the Lord. She just struggled. Later that evening, she was with Ed, and you can yeah, she was. She was with me, and we, we have a playroom in our house. It's now for the grandkids, so... I made a little bed for her, and it was about maybe 10 o'clock at night. And so, so I, I kissed her. I said, Lee Beth, I love you, and, and, and God's going to take us through this. And I go, listen, I'll be right in my office, you know, studying for a message. So if you need anything, you just, you just call. So I walked into my office, and I was preparing for a message on Abraham and Isaac out of Genesis chapter 22, and I, I was writing these words. You'll, you'll see it on the screen. This is, the, this is from my uh, notes. Where's the lamb? The Lord will provide, and then I wrote, laid him on an altar on top of wood. Then I heard a sound like I'd never heard before. Lee Beth, Lee Beth, nothing. Ran into the room, and in essence, she was gone from this earth. And she moved from this earth to heaven. So, obviously, Lisa and I were devastated. We're still devastated. We're still grieving. Again, like I said, we'll, we'll never get over it, but the next couple of days, as we were reeling and searching and just groping for strength and, and, and peace, we began to talk about this situation. And we just said, you know, we don't know why this happened. We don't. But we want to put it, this story, on the altar. We can't alter it. A-L-T-E-R, but we can alter it, A-L-T-A-R. So we put this story on the altar, and we said we're going to tell it honestly, and we're going to tell it biblically, and if we have an opportunity to share the story with one person or more, we're going to do it. So I want to ask you just a a straight up question, have you altered your life? Because all these things that we're talking about, it only is possible through the power of the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because God saw this cosmic chasm created by our sinfulness and he made up the distance, didn't he? He sent Jesus to live a perfect life, to die a sacrificial death, and three days later to rise again. And Jesus offers you and me forgiveness, redemption, eternal life. He just says, alter your life. Give it to me. Have you made that decision? Has that transaction taken place? Because the moment you open up the lid of your life, 
to Christ. He'll come in, equip you, forgive you, purpose you, and begin the beautiful change from the Holy Spirit as he works from the inside out to walk a path, even a path through pain.